All right, so starting chapter four, book of First Samuel, reading out of the NIV translation. Let's get started. Uh, chapter four. And Samuel's word came to all Israel. Chapter four, verse one. The Philistines captured the ark. Now the Israelites went out to fight against the Philistines. The Israelites camped at Ebenezer and the Philistines at Aphek. The Philistines deployed their forces to meet Israel, and as the battle spread, Israel was defeated by the Philistines, who killed about 4,000 of them on the battlefield. When the soldiers returned to camp, the elders of Israel asked, Why did the Lord bring defeat on us today before the Philistines? Let us bring the ark of the Lord, Lord's covenant from Shiloh, so that he may go with us and save us from the hand of our enemies. So the people sent men to Shiloh, and they brought back the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord Almighty, who is enthroned between the cherubim, and Eli's two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, were there, were there with the Ark of the Covenant of God. Verse 5, When the Ark of the Lord's Covenant came into the camp, all Israel raised such a great shout that the ground shook. Hearing the uproar, the Philistines asked, What's all this shouting in the Hebrew camp? When they learned that the ark of the Lord had come into the camp, the Philistines were afraid. A God has come into the camp, they said. Oh no, nothing like this has happened before. We're doomed. Who will deliver us from the hand of these mighty gods? They are the gods who struck the Egyptians with all kinds of plagues in the wilderness. Verse 9, be strong, Philistines. Be men, or you will be subject to the Hebrews as they have been to you. Be men and fight. So the Philistines fought, and the Israelites were defeated, and every man fled to his tent. The slaughter was very great. Israel lost 30,000 foot soldiers. The ark of God was captured, and Eli's two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, died. Death of Eli, verse 12. That same day, a Benjamite ran from the battle line and went to Shiloh with his clothes torn and dust in his head. When he arrived, there was Eli sitting on his chair by the side of the road watching because his heart feared for the ark of god when the man entered entered the town and told what had happened the whole town sent up a cry eli heard the outcry and asked what is the meaning of this uproar the man hurried over to eli who was 98 years old and whose eyes had failed so that he could not see he told eli i have just come from the battle line i fled from it this very day eli asked what happened my son the man who brought the news replied, Israel fled before the Philistines, and the army has suffered heavy losses. Also, your two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, are dead, and the ark of God has been captured. This is pretty big. Verse 18. When he mentioned the ark of God, Eli fell backward off his chair by the side of the gate. His neck was broken and he died. For he was an old man and he was heavy. What? He had led Israel 40 years. Oh my goodness. His daughter-in-law, the wife of Phinehas, was pregnant and near the time of delivery. Oh my goodness. When she heard the news that the Ark of, the Com the Ark of God had been captured and that her father-in-law and her husband were dead, she went into labor and gave birth, but was overcome by her labor pains and she was dying. The woman attending her said, Don't despair, you have given birth to a son. But she did not respond or pay any attention. She named the boy Ichabod, saying, The glory has departed from Israel. Because of the capture of the Ark of God and the deaths, deaths of her father-in-law and her husband, verse 22, she said, The glory has departed from Israel, for the Ark of God has been captured. And that completes chapter 4. Wow. That is wild. All right. Chapter 5. The Ark in Ashad and Ekron. Verse 1. After the Philistines had captured the Ark of God, they took it from Ebenezer to Ashdod. Then they carried the Ark into Dagon's temple and set it beside Dagon. When the people of Ashad rose early the, ne early the next day, there was Dagon, 
fallen on his face on the ground before the ark of the Lord. They took Dagon and put him back in his place. But the following morning when they rose, there was Dagon fallen on his face on the ground before the ark of the Lord. His head and hands had been broken off and were lying on the threshold. Only his body remained. Verse 5, that is why to this day neither the priest of Dagon nor any others who entered Dagon's temple at Ashdod stepped on the threshold. The Lord's hand was heavy on the people of Ashdod and its vicinity. He brought devastation on them and afflicted them with tumors. Verse 7, when the people of Ashdod saw what was happening, they said, The ark of the God of Israel must not stay here with us because his hand is heavy on us and on Dagon, our God. So they called together all the rulers of the Philistines and asked them, What shall we do with the ark of the God of Israel? They answered, Have the ark of the God of Israel moved to Gath. So they moved the ark of the God of Israel. But after they had moved it, the Lord's hand was against that city, throwing it into a great panic. He afflicted the people of the city, both young and old, with an outbreak of tumors. So they sent the ark of God to Ekron. As the ark of God was entering Ekron, the people of Ekron cried out, They have brought the ark of, of the God of Israel around to us to kill us and our people. So they called together all the rulers of the Philistines and said, Send the ark of the God of Israel away. Let it go back to its own place, or it will kill us and our people. For death had filled the city with panic. God's hand was very heavy on it. Those who did not die were afflicted with tumors, and the outcry of the city went up to heaven. And that completes chapter 5. The ark returned to Israel, chapter 6, verse 1. When the ark of the Lord had been in Philistine territory seven months, the Philistines called for the priest and the diviners and said, What shall we do with the ark of the Lord? Tell us how we should send it back to its place. They answered, If you return the ark of the God of Israel, do not send it back to him without a gift. By all means, send a guilt offering to him. Then you will be healed, and you will know why his hand has not been lifted from you. The Philistines asked, What guilt offering should we send him? They replied, Five gold tumors and five gold rats, according to the number of the Philistine rulers, because the same plague has struck both you and your rulers. Make models of the tumors and, and of the rats that are destroying the country and give glory to, to Israel's God. Perhaps he will lift his hand from you and your gods and your land. Why do you harden your hearts as the Egyptians and Pharaoh did? When Israel's God dealt harshly with them, did they not send the Israelites out so they could go on their way? Now then, get a new cart ready with two cows that have calved and have never been yoked. Hitch the cows to the cart but take the calves away and bend them up. Take the ark of the Lord and put it on the cart, and in a chest beside it put the gold objects you are send, sending back to him as a guilt offering. Send it on its way, but keep washing it. If it goes up to its own territory toward Beth Shemesh, then the Lord has brought the great disaster on us. But if it is not, then we will know that it was not his hand that struck us, but that it happened to us by chance. Wow, they have chance in here, the word chance. Verse 10, so they did this. They took two such cows and hitched them to the cart and pinned up their calves. They placed the ark of the Lord on the cart and along with it, the chest containing the gold rats and the models of the tumors. That completes verse 11. I just, I don't know, it's just, I'm just thinking about this with the, why they have the word chance here. And you know how the Bible also says about, it talks about casting lots, right? So, which is also chance, right? Um, you know, to me, when I read that, the word chance, I just think of the odds, you know, like, of course, God knows every little second of our lives and every little detail, every little thing, right? Absolutely. Yes, I believe that. So it's every like that chance. What he's saying is just like that odd, that one in a billion odd of this happening, you know, one in a million odd of this happening, you know, that, that's what I think of. Um, but God still knows, you know, 
again, I kind of compare it to Super Mario. You know, it's like you're playing the game for the first time, second time, third time. You don't know all the secrets to the game, right? And there's just one time you just jump and you hit this mysterious box. And it's like, what are the chances of that happening, you know? Well, it was in the game. It was, it was for you. You didn't know about it. That, that's, that's what I think about. It was, it was still there. You just, you, you did, I guess, the right thing. It was there. I mean, it, it's not really the right thing, but it was a, an, an alternative scenario that was placed in your life that you could have done. It's pretty cool, right? <laughs> it's pretty cool. Um, verse 10. Or I'm sorry, verse 11. They placed the Ark of the Lord on the cart and along with it, the chest contained the gold rats and the models of the tumors. Then the cows went straight up toward Beth Shemesh, keeping on the road and lowing all the way. They did not turn to the right or to the left. The rulers of the Philistines followed them as far as the border of Beth Shemesh. Verse 13. Now the people of Beth Shemesh were harvesting their wheat in the valley. And when they looked up and saw the Ark, they rejoiced at the sight. The cart came to the field of Joshua of Beth Shemesh, and there it stopped beside a large rock. The people chopped up the wood of the cart and sacrificed the cows as a burnt offering to the Lord. The Levites took down the Ark of the Lord, together with the chest containing the gold objects, and placed them on the large rock. On that day, the people of Beth Shemesh offered burnt offerings and made sacrifices to the Lord. The five rulers of the Philistines saw all this and then returned that same day to Ekron. These are the gold tumors the Philistines sent as a guilt offering to the Lord. One each for Eshdod, Gaza, Ashkelaton, Gath, and Ekron. And the number of the gold rats was according to the number of Philistines, Philistine towns belonging to the five rulers. Let me um, put do not disturb... Can I even do that? Yes, I can. All right, back in business. All right, what verse was I on? Yo estoy fregato. <laughs> um, verse 18. And the number of the gold rats were according to the number of Philistine towns belonging to the five rulers. The, the fortified towns with their country villages. The large rock on which Levi set the Lord, of the Ark of the Lord is a witness to this day in the field of Joshua of Beth Shemesh. But God struck down some of the inhabitants of Beth Shemesh, putting 70 of them to death because they looked into the Ark of the Lord. The people mourned because of the heavy blow the Lord had dealt them. And the people of Beth Shemesh asked, who can stand in the presence of the Lord, the whole, this holy God? To whom will the ark go up from here? Verse 21. Then they sent messengers to the people of Kiriath, Jeremiah, saying, The Philistines have returned the ark of the Lord. Come down and take it up to your town. That completes chapter 6. And I kind of still have this slight headache. It's just slight. And I think it's from these pillows. Because when I sleep, my neck's like, and it's broken when I sleep, so it's like I feel like blood's not really getting to my brain. And that's why I'm getting headaches. That's multiple. I guess I'm just gonna have to use my Tempur-Pedic pillow. Chapter 7, verse 1. So the men of Kirath Jerem came and took up the ark of the Lord. They brought it to Abinadab's house on the hill and consecrated Elisar his son to guard the ark of the Lord. The ark remained at Kirath Jerem a long time, 20 years in all. Samuel seduced the Philistines at Mizpah. Then all the people of Israel turned back to the Lord. So Samuel said to all Israelites, if you are returning to the Lord with all your hearts, then rid yourselves of the foreign gods and the Ashtaroths, and commit yourself to the Lord and serve him only, and he will deliver you out of the hand of the Philistines. So the Israelites put away their Baals, Baals and Ashtaroths, and served the Lord only. 
Verse 5, Then Samuel said, Assemble all Israel at Mizpah, and I will intercede with the Lord for you. When they had assembled at Mizpah, they drew water and poured it out from before the Lord. On that day they fasted, and they were con and they and there they confessed, We have sinned against the Lord. Now Samuel was serving the leader of Israel at Mizpah. When the Philistines heard that Israel had assembled at Mizpah, the rulers of the Philistines came up to attack them. When the Israelites heard of it, they were afraid because of the Philistines. They said to Samuel, Do not stop crying out to the Lord our God for us, that he may rescue us from the hand of the Philistines. Then Samuel took a suckling lamb and sacrificed it as a whole burnt offering to the Lord. He cried out to the Lord on Israel's behalf, and the Lord answered him. While Samuel was sacrificing the burnt offering, the Philistines drew near to engage Israel in battle. But that day the Lord thundered with loud thunder against the Philistines and threw them into such a panic that they were routed before the Israelites. Verse 11, The men of Israel rushed out of Mizpah and pursued the Philistines, slaughtering them along the way to a point below Bethkar. Then Samuel took a stone and set it up between Mizpah and Shen. He named it Ebezanir, saying, Thus far the Lord has helped us. So the Philistines were subdued, and they stopped invading Israel's territory. Throughout Samuel's lifetime, the hand of the Lord was against the Philistines. The towns from Ekron to Gath that the Philistines were captured, had captured from Israel were restored to Israel, and Israel delivered the neighboring territory from the hands of the Philistines. And there was peace between Israel and the Amorites. Samuel continued as Israel's leader all the days of his life. From year to year, he went on a circuit from Bethel to Gilgal to Mizpah, judging Israel in all those places. But he always went back to Ramah, where his home was. And there he also held court for Israel, and he built an altar there to the Lord. That completes chapter 7. Israel ask for a king, chapter 8, verse 1. When Samuel grew old, he appointed his sons at Israel's leaders. The name of his firstborn was Joel, and the name of the second was Abijah, and they served at Beersheba, but his sons did not follow his ways. They turned aside after dishonest gain and accepted bribes and perverted justice. So all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah. Verse 5, they said to him, You are old, and your sons do not follow your ways. Now appoint a king to lead us, such as all the other nations have. But when they said, Give us a king to lead us, this displeased Samuel. So he prayed to the Lord, and the Lord told him, Listen to all, the peop all that the people are saying to you. It is not you they have rejected, but they have rejected me as their king. As they have done from the day I brought them up out of Egypt until this day, forsaking me and serving other gods, so they are doing to you. Now listen to them, but warn them solemnly and let them know what the king who will reign over them will claim as his rights. Verse 10, Samuel told all the words of the Lord to the people who were asking him for a king. He said, this is what the king who will reign over you will claim as his rights. He will take your sons and make them serve with his chariots and horses, and they will run in front of his chariots. Some he will assign to be commanders of thousands and commanders of fifties, and others to plow his ground and reap his harvest, and still others to make weapons of war and equipment for his chariots. He will take your daughters to be perfumers and cooks and bakers. Verse 14. He will take the best of your fields and vineyards and olive groves and give them to his attendants. He will take a tenth of your grain and your vintage and give it to his officials and attendants. Your male and female servants and the best of your cattle and donkeys he will take for his own use. He will take a tenth of your flocks and you yourselves will become his slaves. When that day comes, you will cry out for relief from the king you have chosen, but the Lord will not answer you in that day. Verse 19. But the people refused to listen to Samuel. No, they said, we want a king over us. Then we will be like all the other nations. 
with a king to lead us and to go out before us and fight our battles. When Samuel heard all that the people said, he repeated it before the Lord. The Lord answered, Listen to them and give them a king. Then Samuel said to the Israelites, Everyone go back to your own town. Yeah, completes chapter 8. Um, chapter 9. Samuel anoints Saul. Verse 1. There was a Benjamite, a man of standing, whose name was Kish, son of Ebel, the son of Zerah, the son of Bekoroth, the son of Aphia of Benjamin. Kish had a son named Saul, as handsome a young man as could be found anywhere in Israel, and he was a head taller than anyone else. Now the donkeys belonging to Saul's father, Kish, were lost. And Kish said to his son Saul, Take one of the servants with you and go and look for the donkeys. So he passed through the hill country of Ephraim and through the sea around Shalisha, but they did not find them. They went on into the district of Shalim, but the donkeys were not there. Then he passed through the territory of Benjamin, but they did not find them. Verse 5, when they reached the district of Zuf, Saul said to the servant who was with him, Come, let's go back, or my father will stop thinking about the donkeys and start worrying about us. But the servant replied, Look, in this town there is a man of God. He is highly respected, and everything he says comes true. Let's go there now. Perhaps he will tell us what way to take. Saul said to his servant, If we go, what can we give the man? The food in our sacks is gone. We have no gift to take to the man of God. What do we have? Verse 8, The servant answered him again, Look, he said, I have a quarter of a shekel of silver. I will give it to the man of God so that he will tell us what, what way to take. Parentheses. Formerly, in Israel, if someone went to inquire of God, they would say, Come, let us go to the seer, because the prophet of today used to be called a seer. Close parentheses. Overseer? All right. Verse 10. Good, uh, Saul said to his servant. Come, let's go. So they went out for the town where the man of God was. As they were going up the hill to the town, they met some young woman coming out to draw water. And they asked them, is the seer here? The prophet, the man of God. Um, verse 12, he's, he is, they answered. He's ahead of you. Hurry now. He, is, he has just come to our town today, and the people have a sacrifice at the high place. As soon as you enter the town, you will find him before he goes up to the high place to eat. The people will not begin eating until he comes, because he must bless the sacrifice. Afterward, those who are invited will eat. Go up now. You should find him about this time. They went up to the town, and as they were entering it, there was Samuel coming toward them on his way up to the high place. Verse 15. Now the day before Saul came, the Lord had revealed this to Samuel. About this time tomorrow, I will send you a man from the land of Benjamin, anoint him ruler over the people, over my people, Israel. He will deliver them from the hand of the Philistines. I have looked on my people, for their cry has reached me. When Samuel caught sight of Saul, the Lord said to him, This is the man I spoke to you about. He will govern my people. Saul approached Samuel in the gateway and asked, Would you please tell me where the seer's house is? I am the seer, Samuel replied. Go up ahead of me to the high place, for today you are to eat with me. And in the morning I will send you on your way and will tell you all that is in your heart. As for the donkeys you lost three days ago, do not worry about them. They have been found. And to whom is all the desire of Israel returned, if not to you and your whole family line? I'm sorry. If not to you and your whole family line? There's a question mark there. Verse 21. Saul answered, But am I not a Benjamite? 
from the smallest tribe of Israel? And is not my clan the least of all the clans of the tribe of Benjamin? Why do you say such a thing to me? Then Samuel brought Saul and his servant into the hall and seated them at the head of those who were invited, about 30 in number. Samuel said to the cook, bring the piece of meat I gave you, the one I told you to lay aside. So the cook took up the thigh with what was on it and set it in front of Saul. Samuel said, here is what has been kept for you. Eat, because it was set aside for you for this occasion from the time I said, I have invited guests. And Saul dined with Samuel that day. Verse 25. After they came down from the high place to the town, Samuel talked with Saul on the roof of his house. They rose about daybreak, and Samuel called to Saul on the roof, Get ready, and I will send you on your way. When Saul got ready, he and Samuel went outside together, and they were going down to the edge of the town. Samuel said to Saul, Tell the servant to go on ahead of us. And the servant did so. But you stay here for a while, so that I may give you a message from God. Oh, my back. And that completes chapter 9. My back should be, like, acting up like this. Oh, my back. All right. Light break. Slight break. You know, this past weekend, um, I was battling with um, some some fleshly desires that I wanted to fall back into. But um, I'm very thankful um, for the church community that I have at Driftwood Church, such as Pastor Eddie, um, as well as I'm happy that I made a decision to go to church because I didn't want to go to church. And it's not like if you're saved and you don't, and if you miss a Sunday, you're going to hell. That, no, I don't believe that one bit. Um, and we shouldn't be condemned because we miss a Sunday. Um, there's just times where I feel like I don't want to go to church on this day, you know? And usually those are the, usually those are the days where you need to go to church. <laughs> um, it's usually like when you don't want to work out, but you have like the best workout when you go to the gym. It's it's kind of like that. Um, and I I didn't want to go, but I'm like I know that if I don't go, I'm gonna it's gonna hurt me. I just I. It's just me personally, how I feel at, at my level right now in life, where I'm just like it's gonna hurt me if I miss. I I, I wanna I wanna be in the house of the Lord. So um. But man, you know, I had a decision. I had decisions to make. Me personally, as a man, as as myself, I had decisions to make because um, at the end of the day, it is my decision if I want to fall back into those things. It is my decision if I want to go to church. It's my decision. It's my choice that I wanted to talk to Pastor Eddie about certain things in my heart, you know. And I'm just so happy that I did because that was a, a leveling up moment where I needed, I absolutely needed because I already predicated, I already had provisions of the flesh after service. And I'm glad that I'm like, you know what? I don't want to be that hypocrite. I don't want to be that hypocrite in church. I've seen it too much. And Pastor Eddie was just, he was just, he was in touch with the Holy Spirit because it was, it was speaking to me what, what God was giving him through scripture, what I was reading. And I'm like, man, I gotta talk to pastor about this. So I talked to him after service. I'm like, I need to talk, you know, I need a vent, I need to. <laughs> and he was just so nice, so loving and, you know, just like, yeah, you know, um, let's go, let's go out to eat. So we went out to eat and we had such a great time. Um, his wife came and um, she had left because she was feeling sick. Um, 
And um, I mean, it, it definitely happened for a reason because we were there for like three or four hours talking. Um, and we talked about some great stuff and um, it was much needed. It was much needed because um, I didn't fall back into the, that stuff, you know? It, the, the, these are the daily battles or just battles in general that um, as a Christian that we're gonna face and we're gonna have to come to a decision and be like, all right, well, man, I, I used to do that before, right? Do I want to slip back into that again? Like, and then it's like you get into that stubbornness, like, man, I, I, I do, I'm going to, I don't want, I don't want to listen to God. But it can be hard to channel that. And I'm so happy that I was able to somehow, and I believe it was through prayer the night before, because I was giving God my heart and just telling him what I was feeling. And because I was hurting in a lot of areas with, 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 with certain things. Um, so um, he answered my prayer, but I still had to take, I think this was like the hardest part. I still had to take that step. I still had to open up my mouth and speak to pastor. I had to ask him if he could help me, you know, ask basically. And he did, and he did. So thankful for him for that. And, um, I saw, I saw what I envisioned. I, I saw the start of something special that day. So it was pretty cool. So uh, yeah, it's felt like sharing that. So I'm going to read, continue reading, um, chapter ten, uh, book of First Samuel, verse one. Then Samuel took a flask of olive oil and poured it on Saul's head and kissed him, saying, Has not the Lord anointed you ruler over his inheritance? When you leave me today, you will meet two men near Rachel's tomb at Zelzah on the border of Benjamin. They will say to you, The donkeys will set you out to look for you. I'm sorry. The donkeys you set out to look for have been found. And now your father has stopped thinking ab about them and is worried about you. He is asking, what shall I do about my son? Then you will go on from there until you reach the, tr the great tree of Tabor. Three men going up to worship God at Bethel will meet you there. One will be carrying three young goats, another three loaves of bread, and another a skin of wine. They will greet you and offer you two loaves of bread, which you will accept from them. After that, you will go to Gibeah of God, where there is a Philistine outpost. As you approach the town, you will meet a procession of prophets coming down from the high place with lyrics, trembles, pipes, and harps playing before them, and they will be prophesying. Real quick, um, I, I also want to say, you know, you know, cry out to the Lord when, when those things happen to you. Um, um, like uh, as my story I was explaining of what happened to me this past weekend because I was in this I was I was distraught like Saturday night I was I was down you know and um, that prayer that heartfelt prayer to the Lord you know he heard that prayer and he, and he hears our prayers and um, and that that did something tell me that did something you know even it was hard to even do that open up and I didn't even really know what to say but just and it could be hard, but just, just get it out. Just get it out. Just whatever you're thinking, whatever you're just thinking about, it's, uh, that makes you go like that. Uh, just, just tell him, just let it out. Just tell him, you know? And um, he hears us. He hears us. All right. Verse six, the spirit of the Lord will come powerfully upon you and you will prophesy with them and you will be changed into a different person. Once you see... Once these signs are fulfilled, do whatever your hands find finds to do, for God is with you. Go down ahead of me to Gilgal. I will surely come down to you to sacrifice burnt offerings and fellowship offerings. But you must wait seven days until I come to you and tell you what you are to do. Saul made king. Verse 9, as Saul turned to leave Samuel, God changed Saul's heart. Verse 
something there. And all these signs were fulfilled that day. When he and his servant arrived at Gibeah, a procession of prophets met him. The Spirit of God came powerfully upon him, and he joined in their prophesying. When all those who had formerly known him saw him prophesying with the prophets, they asked each other, What is this that has happened to the son of Kish? Is Saul also among the prophets? A man who lived there answered, And who is their father? So it became a saying, Is Saul also among the prophets? Verse 13. After Saul stopped prophesying, he went to the high place. Now Saul's uncle asked him and, and his servant, Where have you been? Looking for the donkeys, he said. But when we saw that they were not to be found, we went to Samuel. Saul's uncle said, Tell me what Samuel said to you. Saul replied, He assured us that the donkeys had been found, but he did not tell his uncle what Samuel had said about the kingship. I wonder why. Uh, verse 17, Samuel summoned the people of Israel to the Lord at Mizpah and said to them, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. I brought Israel up out of Egypt and delivered you from the power of Egypt and all the kingdoms that oppressed you. But you have now rejected your God, who saved you out of all your disasters and calamities. And you have said, No, appoint a king over us. So now present yourselves before the Lord by your tribes and clans. When Sam, verse 20, when Samuel had all Israel come, before, come forward by tribes, the tribe of Benjamin was taken by Lot. It's just interesting how this is happening because the people cried out for a new king, right? And Saul cried out to the Lord saying what the people wanted. And basically God said, do as they wish type of deal, right? Because it's what the people wanted. And now, it, is it biting them in the butt? Um, so, verse 21. Then he, look at, um, Benjamin was taken by Lot. Uh, then he brought, verse 21. Then he brought forward the tribe of Benjamin, clan by clan, and Matri's clan was taken. Finally, Saul, son of Kish, was taken, but when they looked for him, he was not to be found. So they inquired further, further of the Lord, Has the man come here yet? And the Lord said, Yes, he has hidden himself among the supplies. They ran and brought him out, and as he stood among the people who was a head taller than any of the others, Samuel said to all the people, Do you see the man the Lord has chosen? There is no one like him among all the people. Then the king, or then the people shouted, Long live the king! Verse 25, Samuel explained to the people the rights and duties of, of kingship. He wrote them down on a scroll and de de deposited before the Lord. Then Samuel dismissed the people to go to their homes. Saul also went to his home in Gibeah, accompanied by valiant, valiant men whose hearts God had touched. But some scoundrels said, How can this fellow save us? They despised him and brought him no gifts, but Saul kept silent. Hmm. That completes chapter 10, interesting chapter. Uh-oh, things are going to get pretty, uh, <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> you thought the... The first five books and the books after the Torah were good as it gets better. It gets better. Alright, um Oh man, this headache. Oh slight it's just a slight headache, you know, it's nothing major like a migraine or a headache headache, it's just a slight headache, you know. It happens oh, every time I lean, I lay on these pillows that are, um, you know, they're not, I'm just not properly laid down in what I believe it is the blood flow. That might sound crazy right now, but I believe it's because I'm not getting proper flow, blood flow to the brain and I'm just like, ah, you know, so, uh. All right, Saul rescues the city of Jebesh, chapter 11, verse 1. 
Nabesh the Ammonite went up and be besieged Jabesh Gilead. And all the men of Jabesh said to him, Make a treaty with us, and we will be subject to you. But Nahash the Am Ammonite replied, I will make a treaty with you only on the condition that I gouge out the right eye of every one of you, and so bring disgrace on all Israel. The elders of Jabesh said to him, Give us seven days so we can send messengers throughout Israel. If no one comes to rescue us, we will surrender to you. That completes verse 3. <laughs> it just reminded me of what Pastor Eddie said about pirates. And the reason why they have a patch is not because they don't have an eye there, which I thought it was. But it's for that they have one eye trained in the dark, so that way when they go inside the ship, they can see. Didn't know that. Maybe you did, maybe you didn't. Leave a comment. Like and sub please like and subscribe my channel. Thank you very much. All right, all right, all right. Let's 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 continue. Um, where was I? Verse four. When the messengers came to Gibeah of Saul and reported these terms to the people, they all wept aloud. Just then Saul was returning from the fields behind his oxen and he asked what is wrong with everyone why are they weeping then they repeated to him what the men of Jabesh had said when Saul heard their words the Spirit of God came powerfully upon him and he burned with anger he took a pair of oxen cut them into pieces and sent the pieces by messengers throughout Israel proclaiming this is what will be done to the oxen of anyone who does not follow Saul and Samuel then the terror of the Lord fell on the people, and they came out together as one. Verse 8, When Saul mustered them at Bezek, the men of Israel numbered 300,000, and those of Judah 30,000. They told the messengers who had come, Say to the men of Jabesh Gilead, By the time the sun is hot tomorrow, you will be rescued. When the messengers went and reported this to the men of Jabesh, they were elated. They said to the Ammonites, Tomorrow we will surrender to you, and you can do to us whatever you like. The next day Saul separated his men into three divisions. During the last watch of the night, they broke into the camp of the Ammonites and slaughtered them until the heat of the day. Those who survived were scattered, so that no two of them were left together. Saul confirmed as king. Verse 12. The people... Then said to Samuel, Who was it that asked? <sighs> you listening? Who was it that asked, Shall Saul reign over us? Turn these men over to us so that we may put them to death. But Saul said, No one will be put to death today, for this day the Lord has rescued Israel. Then Samuel said to the people, Come, let us go to Gilgal, and there renew the kingship. So all the people went to Gilgal and made Saul king in the presence of the Lord. There they sacrificed fellowship offerings before the Lord, and Saul and all the Israelites held a great celebration. That completes chapter 11. Let's continue. Chapter 12. Samuel's farewell speech. Verse 1. Samuel said to all Israel, I have listened to everything you, you said to me and have set a king over you. Now you have a king as your leader. As for me, I am old and gray, and my sons are here with you. I have been your leader from my youth until this day. Here I stand, testify against me in the presence of the Lord and his anointed. Whose ox have I taken? Whose donkey have I taken? Whom have I cheated? Whom have I oppressed? From whose hand have I accepted a bribe to make me shut my eyes? If I have done any of these things, I will make it right. You have not cheated or oppressed us, they replied. You have not taken anything from anyone's hand. Verse 5, Samuel said to them, The Lord is witness against you, and also has anointed witness this day. And you have not found anything in my hand. 
He is my, he is witness, they said. Then Samuel said to the people, It is the Lord who appointed Moses and, and Aaron and brought your ancestors up out of Egypt. Now then, stand here, because I am going to confront you with evidence before the Lord as to all the, the righteous acts performed by the Lord for you and your ancestors. After Jacob entered Egypt, they cried to the Lord for help, and the Lord sent Moses and Aaron, who brought your ancestors out of Egypt and settled them in, the, in this place. But they forgot the Lord their God, so he sold them into the hand of Sisera, the commander of the army of Hazor, and into the hands of the Philistines and the king of Moab, who fought against them. They cried out to the Lord and said, We have sinned. We have forsaken the Lord and served the, the Baals and the Ashtoreths. But now deliver us from the hands of our enemies, and we will serve you. Verse 11. Then the Lord sent Jerobal, Barak, Jep Jephthah, and Samuel, and he delivered you from the hands of your enemies all around you, so that you lived in safety. But when you saw that Nahash, king of the Ammonites, was moving against you, you said to me, No, we want a king to rule over us. Even though the Lord your God was your king, now here is the king you have chosen, the one you asked for. See, the Lord has set a king over you. If you fear the Lord and serve and obey him and do not rebel against his commands, as if both you and the king who reigns over you follow the Lord your God. Good. Verse 15. But if you do not obey the Lord, and if you rebel against his commands, his hand will be against you as it, will, as it was against your ancestors. Now then, stand still and see this great thing the Lord is about to do before your eyes. Is it not wheat harvest now? I will call on the Lord to send thunder and rain, and you will realize what an evil thing you did in the eyes of the Lord when you asked for a king. Verse 18, then Samuel called on the Lord. And that same day, the Lord sent thunder and rain. So all the people stood in awe of the Lord and of Samuel. Then people all said to Samuel, pray to the Lord your God for your servants so that we will not die. For we have added to all our other sins, the evil of asking for a king. Verse 20, do not be afraid, Samuel replied. You have done all this evil, yet do not turn away from the Lord. But serve the Lord with all your heart. Do not turn away after useless idols. They can do you no good, nor can they rescue you, because they are useless. For the sake of his great name, the Lord will not reject his people, because the Lord was pleased to make you his own. As for me, far be it from me that I shall sin against the Lord by failing to pray for you, and I will teach you the way that is good and right. But be sure to fear the Lord and serve him faithfully with all your heart. Consider what great things he has done for you. Yet if you if you persist in doing evil, both you and your king will perish. That completes chapter 12. And it is the new day, midnight, 12.02 a.m., May 17, 2022, in the year of our Lord. Thank you, Lord, for this day. Thank you for your scriptures. Thank you for pastor. Thank you for Driftwood Church. Thank you for me living in this house, Lord Jesus, me, that you have provided a room, Lord Jesus. Thank you that, that you are, um, that you give me revelation of your scriptures, Lord. Um, I pray that I may be sensitive to the Holy Spirit, and I pray that I may be sound and tuned to the Holy Spirit and what you are telling me and today, this new day that you've made for me, Lord Jesus. Amen. In Jesus' name, amen. Alright. Samuel rebukes Saul. Dang. Don't you, don't, you, don't you hate when that happens? It's like, your buddy buddies, you do, everything's good. Everything's good. You know, you, you're sitting at the roof. You got olive oil poured on your head because you, you're going to be the new king. And then, you know, you, you get in, this, in the dispute. Like, it's... <laughs> Time and time it shows it's going to happen. Even friends I used to be friends with got into arguments, you know. It's just like, oh. 
but the word says try to make peace with everyone so always try our best to to um, try to keep these relationships in peace so, all right Sam, Samuel rebukes Saul chapter 13 verse 1 Saul was 30 years old when he became king and he reigned over Israel 42 years Saul chose 3,000 men from Israel 2,000 were with him at Michmash and in the hill country of Bethel and a thousand were with Jonathan at Gibeah and Benjamin the rest of the men he sent back to their homes Jonathan attacked the Philistine outpost at Geba and the Philistines heard about it then Saul had the trumpet blown throughout the land and said let the Hebrews hear so all Israel heard the news Saul has attacked the Philistine outpost, and now Israel has become obnoxious to the Philistines. Wow, we see the word obnoxious. And the people were summoned to join Saul at Gilgal. Verse 5, the Philistines assembled to fight Israel with 3,000 men, chariots, 6,000 charioteers, and soldiers as numerous as the sand on the seashore. Wow, that's a lot. They went up and camped at Michmash, the east of Beth Avon. When the Israelites saw that their situation was critical and that their army was hard pressed, they hid in caves and thickets among the rocks and in pits and cisterns. Some Hebrews even crossed the Jordan to the land of Gad and Gilead. Saul remained at Gilgal and all the troops with him were quaking with fear. He waited seven days, the time set by Samuel. But Samuel did not come to Gilgal, and Saul's men be began to scatter. So he said, Bring me the burnt offering and the fellowship offerings. And Saul offered up the burnt offering. Just as he finished making the offering, Samuel arrived, and Saul went out to greet him. What have you done? asked Samuel. Saul replied, When I saw that the men were scattering, and that you did not come at, that, at the set time, and that the Philistines were assembling at Mikmash, I thought, now the Philistines will come down against me at Gilgal, and I have not sought the Lord's favor. So I felt compelled to offer the burnt offering. You have done a foolish thing, Samuel said. You have not kept the command the Lord your God gave you. If you had, he would have established your kingdom over Israel for all time. Wow. Verse 14. But now your kingdom will not endure. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart. David that's it's, it's gonna be David because that that's what David's known for a man after God's own heart Wow and appointed him ruler of his people because you have not kept the Lord's command then Samuel left Gilgal and went up to Gibeah and Benjamin who were with them they numbered about 600 Israel without weapons. Verse 16. Saul and his son Jonathan and the men with them were staying in Gibeah. And Benjamin, while the Philistines camped at Michmash, raiding parties went out from the Philistine camp in three d detachments. One turned toward Oprah in the vicinity of Shaul, another toward Beth Huron and the third toward the borderland overlooking the valley of Zeboim, facing the wilderness. Now, not a blacksmith could be found in the whole land of Israel, because the Philistines had said, otherwise the Hebrews will make swords of spears. So all Israel went down to the Philistines to have their plow points, mattocks, axes, and sickles sharpened. The price was two-thirds of a shekel for sharpening plow points and mattocks, and a third of a shekel for sharpening forks and axes, and for repointing goads. Verse 22. So on the day of the battle, not a soldier with Saul and Jonathan had a sword or spear in his hand. Only Saul and his son Jonathan had them. Jonathan attacks the Philistines. Verse 23. Now a detachment of Philistines had gone out to the pass of Michmash. 
that completes chapter 13. So there's about, um, I think, 30 chapters. Yep, uh, 31 chapters in the soul. So we're almost halfway. Okay. I'll do it for you. Chapter 14, verse 1. One day, Jonathan, son of Saul, said to his younger armor bearer, Come, let's go over to the Philistine outpost on the other side. But he did not tell his father. Saul was staying on the outskirts of Gibeah under a pomegranate tree in Migron, with him about 600 men, among whom was Ahijah, who was wearing an ephod. He was a son of Echabod's brother Ahitib, son of Phinehas, the son of Eli, the Lord's priest in Shiloh. No one was aware that Jonathan had left. Verse 4, on each side of the pass that Jonathan attempted to cross to reach the Philistine outpost was a cliff. One was called Boziz and the other Seneh. One cliff stood to the north toward Michmash, the other to the south toward Giba. Jonathan said to his younger armor bearer, Come, let's go over to the outpost of those uncircumcised men. Perhaps the Lord will act in our behalf. Nothing can hinder the Lord from saving, whether by many or by few. Do all that you have in mind, his armor bearer said. Go ahead, I am with you, heart and soul. Verse 8, Jonathan said, Come on, then. We will cross over toward them and let them see us. If they say to us, wait there until we come to you, we will stay where we are and not go up to them. But if they say, come up to us, we will climb up because that will be our sign that the Lord has given them into our hands. So both of them showed themselves to the Philistine outpost. Look, said the Philistines, the Hebrews are crawling out of the holes they were hiding in. The men of the outpost shouted to Jonathan and his armor bearer, Come up to us and we'll teach you a lesson. So Jonathan said to his armor bearer, Climb up after me. The Lord had given them into the hand of Israel. Jonathan climbed up using his hands and feet with his armor bearer right behind him. The Philistines fell before Jonathan and his armor bearer fo followed and killed behind him. Well, in that first attack, Jonathan and his armor bearer killed some 20 men in the area of about half an acre. Israel routs the Philistines. Verse 15. Then panic struck the whole army, those in the camp and field, and those in the outposts and raiding parties, and the ground shook. It was a panic sent by God. Shal, Saul's lookout at Gibeah and Benjamin saw the army melting away in all directions. Then Saul said to the men who were with him, Muster the forces and see who has left us. When they did, it was Jonathan and his armor bearer who were not there. Saul said to Ahijah, Bring the ark of God. Parentheses. At that time, it was with the Israelites. Close parentheses. While Saul was talking to the priest, the, the tumult in the Philistine camp increased more and more. So Saul said to the priest, Withdraw your hand. Then Paul, or Saul, and all his men assembled and went to the battle. They found the Philistines in total confusion, striking each other with their word swords. Those Hebrews who had previously been with the Philistines and had gone up with them to their camp went over to the Israelites who were with Saul and Jonathan. When all the Israelites who had hidden in the hill country of Ephraim heard that the Philistines were on the run, they joined the battle in hot pursuit. So on that day, the Lord saved Israel, and the battle moved on beyond Beth Edom. Jonathan eats honey. <laughs> Verse 24, Now the Israelites were in distress that day, because Saul had bound the people under an oath, saying, 
Cursed be anyone who eats food before evening comes, before I have avenged myself on my enemies. So none of the troops tasted food. The entire army entered the woods, and there was honey on the ground. When they went into the woods, they saw the honey oozing out, yet no one put his hand to his mouth, because they feared the oath. But Jonathan had not heard that his father had bound the people with the oath, so he reached out the end of the staff that was in his hand and dipped it into the honeycomb. He raised his hand to his mouth, and his eyes brightened. Verse 28. Then one of the soldiers told him, Your father bound the army under a strict oath, saying, Cursed be anyone who eats food today. That is why the men are faint. Jonathan said, My father has made trouble for the country. See how my eyes brightened when I tasted a little of this honey. How much better it would have been if the men had eaten today some of the plunder they took from their enemies. Would not the slaughter of the Philistines have been even greater? That day, after the Philistines had stuck, struck down the Philistines from Michmash to Ajalon, they were exhausted. They pounced on the, pl the plunder, and taking sheep, cattle, and calves, they butchered them on the ground and ate them, together with the blood. Then someone said to Saul, Look! The men are sinning against the Lord by eating meat that has blood in it. You have broken faith, he said. Roll, it, roll a large stone over here at once. Then he said, go out among them and tell them, each of you bring me your cattle and sheep and slaughter them here and eat them. Do not sin against the Lord by eating meat with blood still in it. So everyone brought his ox that night and slaughtered it there. Verse 35. Then Saul built an altar to the Lord, it was the first time he had done this. Saul said, Let us go down and pursue the Philistines by night and plunder them till dawn. And let us not leave one of them alive. Do whatever seems best to you, they replied. But the priest said, Let us inquire of God here. So Saul asked God, Shall I go down and pursue the Philistines? Will you give them into Israel's hand? But God did not answer him that day. Verse 38. Saul therefore said, Come here, all you who are leaders of the army, and let us find out what sin has been committed today. As surely as the Lord who rescues Israel lives, even if the guilt lies with my son Jonathan, he must die. But not one of them said a word. Saul then said to all the Israelites, You stand over there. I and Jonathan, my son, will stand over here. Do what seems best to you, they replied. Then Saul prayed to the Lord. The God of Israel, why have you not answered your servant today? If the fault is in me or my son Jonathan, respond with Aram. But if the men of Israel are at fault, respond with Thummim. Thummim. Jonathan and Saul were taken by lot, and the men were cleared. Saul said, Cast the lot between me and Jonathan, my son. And Jonathan was taken. Then Saul said to Jonathan, Tell me what you have done. So Jonathan told him, I tasted a little honey with the end of my staff, and now I must die. Verse 44, Saul said, May God deal with me, be it ever so severely, if you do not die, Jonathan. But the men said to Saul, Should, should Jonathan die, he who has brought about this great deliverance in Israel? Never! As surely as the Lord lives, not a hair of his head will fall to the ground, for he did this today with God's help. So the men rescued Jonathan, and he was not put to death. Then Saul stopped pursuing the Philistines, and they withdrew to their own land. After Saul had assumed rule over Israel, he fought against their enemies on every side. Moab, the Ammonites, Edom, the kings of Zobah, and the Philistines, Wherever he returned, he inflicted punishment on them. He fought valiantly and defeated the Amalekites, Amalekites, delivering Israel from the hands of those who had plundered them. Saul's family, verse 49. Saul's sons were Jonathan, Ishvi, and Malki Shua. 
For the name of his older daughter was Mirab, and that of the younger was Michael. 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 Verse 50. His wife's name was Ahinoam, daughter of Ahimaaz. The name of the commander of Saul's army was Abner, son of Ner, and Ner was Saul's uncle. Saul's father Kish and Abner's father Ner were sons of Abil. All the days of Saul there was bitter war with the Philistines, and whenever Saul was a mighty or brave man, he took him into his service. And that completes chapter 14. Oh, all right, we're just gonna read one more chapter because chapter 16, wow, it's gonna get good. All right, the Lord rejects Saul as king. Chapter 15, verse one, Samuel said to Saul, I am the one the Lord has sent to anoint you king over his people Israel. So listen now to the message from the Lord. This is what the Lord Almighty says. I will punish the Amalekites for what they did to Israel when they waylaid, when they waylaid them as they came up from Egypt. Now go, attack the Amalekites and totally destroy all that belongs to them. Do not spare them. Put to death men and women, children and infants, cattle and sheep, camels and donkeys. So Saul summoned the men and mustered them at Telam, 200,000 foot soldiers and 2,000 from Judah. Saul went to the city of Amalek and set an ambush in the ravine. Then he said to the Kenites, go away, leave the Amalekites so that I do not destroy you along with them. For you showed kindness to all the Israelites when they came up out of Egypt. So the Kenites moved away from the Amalekites. Then Saul at attacked the Amalekites all the way from Havilah, Havilah to Shur, near the eastern border of Egypt. He took Agog, king of the Amalekites, alive, and all his people he totally destroyed with the sword. Verse 9, Paul set, Paul, <laughs> but Saul and the army spared Agog, and the best of the sheep and cattle, the fat calves and lambs, everything that was good. These they were unwilling to destroy completely, but everything that was despised and weak, they totally destroyed. Then the word of the Lord came to Samuel. I regret that I have made Saul king because he has turned away from me and has not carried out my instructions. Samuel was angry and he cried out to the Lord all that night. See, he was angry. But he cried to the Lord all that night. Verse 12. Early in the morning, Samuel got up and went to meet Saul. But he was told, Saul has gone to Carmel. There he has set up a monument in his own honor and has turned and gone on down to Gilgal. When Samuel reached him, Saul said, The, the Lord bless you. I have carried out the Lord's instructions. But Samuel said, What then is this bleating of sheep in my ears? What is this lowing of cattle that I hear? Saul answered, The soldiers bought them from the Amalekites. They spared the best of the sheep and cattle to sacrifice to the Lord your God. But we totally destroyed the rest. Enough, Samuel said to Saul. Let me tell you what the Lord has said to me last night. Tell me, Saul replied. Samuel said, Although you were once small in your own eyes, did you not become the head of the tribes of Israel? The Lord anointed you king over Israel, and he sent you on a mission, saying, Go and completely destroy those wicked people, the Amalekites. Wage war against them until you have wiped them out. Why did you not obey the Lord? Why did you pounce on the plunder and do evil in the eyes of the Lord? But I did obey the Lord, Saul said. I went on the mission the Lord assigned me. I completely destroyed the Amalekites and brought back Agog, their king. The soldiers took sheep and cattle from the plunder, the best of what we devoted to God, the best of what was devoted to God, in order to sacrifice them to the Lord your God at Gilgal. 
Verse 22, but Sandra replied, does the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much in obeying the Lord? In the New Testament, it says God respects more of your obedience than sacrifice. And he honors that. Um, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to heed is better than the fat of rams. For rebellion is like the sin of divination, and arrogance like the evil of idolatry. It's going to highlight that. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has rejected you as king. Then Saul said to Samuel, I have sinned. I have violated the Lord's command and your instructions. I was afraid of the men, and so I gave in to them. Now I beg you, forgive my sin and come back with me so that I may worship the Lord. But Samuel said to him, I will not go back with you. You have rejected the word of the Lord, and the Lord has rejected you as king over Israel. As Samuel turned to leave, Saul caught hold of the hem of, the hem of his robe, and it tore. Samuel said to him, The Lord has torn the kingdom of Israel from you today, and has given it to one of your neighbors, to one better than you. He who is the glory of Israel does not lie or change his mind, for he is not a human being that he should change his mind interesting verse 30 Saul replied I have sinned but please honor me before the elders of my people and before Israel come back with me so that I may worship the Lord your God so Samuel went back with Saul and Saul worshiped the Lord then Samuel said bring me Agar king of the Amalekites Agar came to him in chains and he thought surely the bitterness of death is past but Samuel said as your sword has made woman childless so will your mother be childless among women and samuel put agog to death before the lord at gilgal verse 34 then samuel left for ramah but saul went up to his throne or to his home in gibeah of, of saul until the day samuel died he did not go to see saul again though samuel mourned for him and the Lord re regretted that he had made Saul king over Israel. Wow. I'm going to read that again. Verse 34 to 35. Then Samuel left for Ramah, but Saul went up to his home in Gibeah of Saul. Until the day Samuel died, he did not go to see Saul again. Though Samuel mourned for him, and the Lord regretted that he had made Saul king over Israel. That completes chapter 15. That's going to complete the reading for today. Um, a little sneak, pre sneak peek into chapter 16. Samuel anoints David. All right. And that will be for another time. Oh, chapter 17, David and Goliath. <laughs> oh my gosh, I kind of feel like reading this now. <laughs> After I saw that. <laughs> oh, I am hungry and I still got this headache, but I want to read this now. I didn't even see that. Let's just continue. All right. Samuel anoints David, chapter 16, verse 1. Look at me, changing my mind. Maybe I'm not fit for a king. <laughs> All right. Chapter 16, verse 1. The Lord said to Samuel, How long will you mourn for Saul, since I have rejected him as king over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and be on your way. I am sending you to Jesse of Bethlehem. I have chosen one of his sons to be king. But Samuel said, how can I go? If Saul hears about it, he will kill me. The Lord said, Take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Invite Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show you what to do. You are to anoint for me the one I indicate. Samuel did what the Lord said. 
When he arrived at Bethlehem, the elders of the town trembled when they met him. They asked, Do you come in peace? Samuel replied, Yes, in peace. I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Consecrate yourselves and come to the sacrifice with me. Then he consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. When they arrived, Samuel saw Eliab and thought, Surely the Lord's anointed stands here before the Lord. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Love that. Then Jesse called Abinadab and had him pass in front of Samuel. But Samuel said, The Lord has not chosen this one either. Jesse then had Shammah pass by. But Samuel said, Nor has the Lord chosen this one. Jesse had seven of his sons pass before Samuel. But Samuel said to him, The Lord has not chosen these. So he asked Jesse, Are these all the sons you have? There is still the youngest. Jesse answered, He is tending the sheep. Samuel said, Send for him. We will not sit down until he arrives. So he sent for him and had him brought in. He was glowing with health and had a fine appearance and handsome features. Then the Lord said, Rise and anoint him. This is the one. So Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And from that day on, the Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David. Samuel then went to Ramah. David in Saul's service. Verse 14. Now the Spirit of the Lord had departed from Saul, and an evil spirit from the Lord tormented him. Saul's attendant said to him, See, an evil spirit from God is tormenting you. Let our Lord command his servants here to search for someone who can play the, the, the lyre. The lyre. He will play when the evil spirit from God comes on you, and you will feel better. So Saul said to his attendants, Find someone who plays well and bring him to me. One of the servants answered, I have seen a son of Jesse of Bethlehem who knows how to play the lyre. He is a brave man and a warrior. He speaks well and is a fine-looking man, and the Lord is with him. Then Saul sent messengers to Jesse and said, Send me your son David, who is with the sheep. So Jesse took a donkey loaded with bread, a skin of wine, and a young goat, and sent them with his son David to Saul. David came to Saul and entered his service. Saul liked him very much, and David became one of his armor bearers. Then Saul said, sent word to Jesse, saying, Allow David to remain in my service, for I am pleased with him. Whenever the Spirit from God came on Saul, David would take up his lyre and play. Then relief will come to Saul. He would feel better, and the evil spirit would leave him. Chapter 16. Wow, I think there's more significance to that than I can even think of right now, but that's, wow. All right, David and Goliath, chapter 17, verse 1. Now the Philistines gathered their forces for war and assembled at Sokot in Judah. They pitched camp at Ephes Damim between Sokot and Azekah. Saul and the Israelites assembled and camped in the valley of Elah and drew up their battle line to meet the Philistines. The Philistines occupied one hill and the Israelites another with the valley between them. A champion named Goliath, who was from Gaith, came out of the Philistine camp. He His height was six cubits and a span. Okay, let's look here. This is about nine feet, nine inches, or about three meters. He had a bronze helmet on his head and wore a coat of scale armor of bronze weighing 5,000 shekels. Let's look what that is. Um, I'm looking at my phone footnotes, by the way, with this information. Um, it has the letter C, so I looked down C. It's right here. That is about 125 pounds. Wow. Or about 58 kilograms. On his legs, he wore bronze greaves and a bronze javelin was slung on his back. His spear shaft was like a, a weaver's rod, 
and its iron point weighed 600 shekels. His shield bearer went ahead of him. Goliath stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel, Why do you come out and line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine? And are you not the servants of Saul? Choose a man and have him come down to me. If he is able to fight and kill me, we will become your subjects. But if I overcome him and kill him, you will become our subjects and serve us. Then the Philist, verse 10, Then the Philistine said, This day I defy the armies of Israel. Give me a man and let us fight each other. On hearing the Philistines' words, Saul and all the Israelites were dismayed and terrified. <laughs> you see this nine foot nine giant freaking talking like that too. Shoot. Verse 12. Now David was the son of an Eph Ephrathite named Jesse, who was from Bethlehem in Judah. Jesse had eight sons, and in Saul's time, he was very old. Jesse's three oldest sons had followed Saul to the war. The first born was Eliab, the second Abinadab and the third Shammah. David was the youngest. The three oldest followed Saul, but David went back and forth from Saul to tend his father's sheep at Bethlehem. Verse 16. For forty days the Philistines came forward every morning and evening and took his stand. Now Jesse said to his son David, Take this ephah of roasted grain and these ten loaves of bread for your brothers and, and hurry for your brothers and hurry to their camp. Take along these ten cheeses to the commander of their unit. See how your brothers are and bring back some assurance from them. They are with Saul and all the men of Israel in the valley of Elah fighting against the Philistines. Early in the morning, David left the flock in the care of, she of a shepherd, loaded up and set out as Jesse had directed. He reached the camp as the army was going out to its battle positions, shouting the war cry. Verse 21, Israel and the Philistines were drawing up their lines facing each other. David left his things with the keeper of supplies, ran to the battle lines, and asked his brothers how they were. As he was talking with them, Goliath, the Philistine champion, was Gath, stepped out from his lines and shouted his usual defiance, and David heard it. Whenever the Israelites saw the man, they all fled from him in great fear. Now the Israelites had been saying, Do you see how this man keeps coming out? He comes out to defy Israel. The king will give great wealth to the man who kills him. He will also give him his daughter in marriage and will accept his exempt his family from taxes in Israel. What? Verse 26. David asked the men standing near him, What will be done for the man who kills this Philistine and removes this disgrace from Israel? Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? They repeated to him what they had been saying and told him, This is what will be done for the man who kills him. When Eliab, David's oldest brother, heard him speaking with the men, he burned with anger at him and asked, Why have you come down here? And with whom did you leave those few sheep in the wilderness? I know how conceited you are and how wicked your heart is. You came down only to watch the battle. Now what have I done? Said David. Can I even speak? He then turned away to someone else and brought up the same matter. And the men answered him as before. What David said was overheard and reported to Saul. And Saul sent for him. David said to Saul, Let no one lose heart on account of this Philistine. Your servant will go and fight him. Saul replied, You are not able to go out against the Philistine and fight him. You are only a young man, and he has been a warrior from his youth. But David said to Saul, Your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. When a lion or a bear came and carried off a sheep from the flock, I went after it, struck it, and rescued the sheep from its mouth. Nice. When it turned on me, I seized it by its hair, struck it, and killed it. What? <laughs> Verse 36. Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear. This uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them. Ooh. Ooh. Hey! A little shimmy. Hey! I felt that one. That was raw. Because he has defied the armies of the living God. 
The Lord who rescued me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will rescue me from the hand of, the, of this Philistine. Saul said to David, Go, and the Lord be with you. Then Saul dressed David in his own tunic. He put a coat of armor on him and a bronze helmet on his head. David fastened on his sword over the tunic and tried walking around because he was not used to them. I cannot go in these, he said to Saul, because I am not used to them. So he took them off. Verse 39. See, that that's so critical, right? Because it's like playing it a basketball game, football game, a UFC fight, and doing things, MMA fight, doing things, new things that you didn't do in practice. Like it's probably not going to come that easier when you have those new things, right? Verse 40. Then he took his staff in his hand, chose five smooth stones from the stream, but put them in the pouch of his, of his shepherd's bag, and with his sling in his hand, approached the Philistine. Meanwhile, the Philistine, with his shield bear in front of him, kept com coming closer to David. He looked David over and saw that he was little more than a boy, glowing with health and handsome, and he despised him. He said to David, Am I a dog that you come at me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. Come here, he said, and I'll give you, give your flesh to the birds and the and the, the wild animals. Okay, so now the battle is about to take place. Okay, verse four five. David said to the Philistine, "You come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty." <laughs> the shimmy, <laughs> oh, just shimmy. You know, do, you know how you shoot a three. In basketball, you do you just do the shimmy like oof. That was a shimmy right there, man. That was oof, oof. All right. I'll read that again, verse 45. David said to the Philistine, You come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hands, and I'll strike you down and cut off your head. This very day I will give the carcasses of the Philistine army to the birds and the wild animals, and the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. Mm, that's so raw, man. Verse 47, all those gathered here will know that it is not by sword or spear that the Lord saves. For the battle is the Lord's, and he will give all of you into, your hand, into our hands. As the Philistine moved closer to attack him, David ran quickly toward the battle line to meet him. Dang, he was like, whoo, whoo, whoo. Reaching into his bag and taking out a stone, he slung it and struck the Philistine on the forehead. The, the stone sank into his forehead and he fell face down on the ground. Boom! Verse 50. So David triumphed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone. Without a sword in his hand, he struck down the Philistine and killed him. What do you need? You need the Lord to fight your battles. That's what I'm reading. David ran and stood over him. He took hold of the Philistine sword and drew it from the sheath. After he killed him, he cut off his head with the sword. When the Philistines saw that their hero was dead, they turned and ran. Then the men of Israel, that just shows you the importance of a leader as well. Any leader, any so-called leader. Um, then the men of Israel and Judah surged forward without a shout and pursued the Philistines to the entrance of Gath and to the gates of Ekron. Their dead were strewn along the Sherem road to Goth and Ekron. When the Israelites returned from chasing the Philistines, they plundered their camp. Verse 54, David took the Philistines' head and brought it to Jerusalem. He put the Philistines' weapons in his own tent, and Saul watched David going out to meet the Philistine. He said to Abner, commander of the army, Abner, whose son is that young man? Abner replied, as surely as you live, your majesty, I don't know. The king said, find out whose son this young man is. 
As soon as David returned from killing the Philistine, Abner took him and brought him before Saul, with David still holding the Philistine's head. Whose son are you, young man? Saul asked. David said, I am the son of your servant Jesse of Bethlehem. And that completes chapter 17. And that will complete this reading for this time. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. That was really good. Super good. I'm glad I read that. I'm glad I did. That was so good. <laughs> All right. Um, well, um, I'm going to get some food because I'm hungry. Make some food. I'm called toast. So, um, all right. Bye.